Hey everyone, welcome back. My name is Chris Adams, president of the Adams Technology Group, and this is our podcast. I don't even know if are we calling it a podcast, video cast. I mean, it is what it is, right? This is a video, and we've got audio, so it'll be a YouTube video and audio, so it makes it a podcast. Anyway, what's here nor there? Um, a topic today I'm pretty passionate about. One of the things that we talk about here at uh, Smata Tech is um, relationships, and I've got I've got this kind of term that we're always talking about. We're always putting relationships above transactions, and um, this this whole podcast today is going to be about culture. It's going to be about leadership and how we need to be looking at our organizations differently, because I think we are so consumed with transactions that we've really lost sight about what our businesses are about today. Um, and so I, I just, I'm just going to start here. I have no idea where this is going uh, to go. I've got a bunch of stuff here. I've got, I mean, I'm getting serious parish. I got the laptop out here cause I got some, some interesting things to read and, and I've been doing some reviewing, um, just, just to give some context in, into how my, my brain works and what we're doing here with our organization, because I think it's important to understand that, um, what we, what we do in our organizations, um, just can't be about transactions. And I'm going to, I'm going to talk about that there, but here's how it all started. So every morning I go through, I've got a couple of websites that I go through and I read, um, kind of what's going on in, in the world for lack of a better term. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I came across this article, uh, Peloton plummets 20% to new record low as capital dwindles and guidance disappoints. Okay. And it, it kind of goes, you know, in here and it says just days after word broke that Peloton was shopping around to find new, uh, find a new minority investor, uh, maybe private equity or pension fund, perhaps to help recapitalize the company as it scrambles to pivot there's a catchy term, pivot and revive its business. The company reported earnings report that was anything but encouraging. Okay. So I, I read through this article and it is nothing but transactions, right? I mean, look at this thing, right? Quarter three results, missed estimates by 9.971.6 million. Um, although they were, there was one important blind spot connected fitness, Connected fitness subscribers climbed to 2.96 million. You know, all of these stats. And then it kind of goes down into this article a little bit farther. And it's just bullet point after bullet point after bullet point. And I think one of the interesting things for me is um, we talk in our businesses about people over profits. Okay. Because um, it, it sounds sexy. You know what I mean? I mean, pe that's what people want to hear. But the problem is that that our company culture isn't people over profits. Our company culture is typically sales driven, cost driven, uh, market share driven, uh, dividend driven. You know, what are we getting on our on our K ones um, versus people driven? Okay. Now let's just be clear about this, right? And I, and I think I've wrote an article about what culture really is, right? Here's what culture really isn't. Uh, on the surface level, um, you know, we've we've got great break rooms, right? I, I, I don't know if you've been into some of these these new offices that people are building, but they are actually incredible. Great workspaces, right? I mean, you can you can go to an area and you and you can play cornhole. Right, or you can go to a small little, you know, area, and you, you can play, you know, your buddy uh, or your colleague on some sort of video game. Right, back in the day, um, you got these workout rooms. You got great desks. You got great lighting. You got, you know, all the great paint. Um, some people are putting kitchens, right, and some people are bringing in chef and catering and all that stuff. I get that. That that's convenient, right? And I and I think it looks good, but that's really not about what culture is right culture and i think it's important to understand what my definition is um culture is a is about people people are about relationships 
and what relationships are about is connection, right? And the, the thing I would ask any CEO or president is, you know, how are you first and foremost connecting with the most important customer you have in your organization? And that is your employees, right? How are you connecting with them, right? Like, and, and, and having conversations that, that are, you know, important or awkward, right? And how, how are we having conversations with our customers, right? I mean, do we even have conversations with our customers anymore? Uh, typically, we, we don't even have very good feedback loops, right? What's a feedback loop that that's going on right now, right? Reviews, right? It's almost like every time I get a support call, I'm getting a text, or I'm getting an email about how was your experience, right? Rate right it from one to five. Well, how is that even getting good information, right? Just to ask for feedback to get feedback is is terrible. You know what I mean? So the thing for me is that that culture is about people, right? Business is about people, okay? But it's relationships and then relationships you know, from, you know, connection, how, how are we, you know, connecting with those things? Um, and then connecting, you know, with our customers, it's uh, a sales driven world that we live in, right? And the thing that struck me with this Peloton article was the fact that there's nothing in here about what the company is actually doing. You know what I mean? So I'm not going to get into Peloton right now. But I'm, I'm going to talk about three companies, three experiences that I just had where I really felt like they had built a customer life with me, right? They had taken care of me because it's rare, okay? Think about all the stuff that we're going on right now, right? Businesses are really good at using the remnants of the pandemic as an excuse to provide terrible customer service, right? I mean, we've all heard about supply chain problems. Right. And I don't know how many conversations I've had, right, especially with our business, you know, that we have in here uh, about supply chain. We can't get this. We can't get that. Right. It's it, I get it. It's challenging. One of the things that we did immediately was we we tripled our inventory. Right. We took that burden on because we knew that there were going to be, you know, all kinds of disruptions. So we're carrying three times the inventory that we would normally carry specifically to provide and continue at the same level of customer service that we have here. Okay. But um, supply chains are, uh, issues are not an excuse. Okay. And I'm going to talk about a couple of really cool companies here that have, have kind of um, taken that and used it to, to their, uh, you know, uh, benefit, right. To, to really provide um, great customer service. Right. And, and I think it's important to understand that when we talk about people, you guys, here's the deal. I, I don't have an agenda. Right. So pardon me if this is not necessarily fluid, but um, but the thing with people, the, the two most expensive parts of a business, right, are two things. One, employee turnover. Right. We, we spend so much money on attracting the right person. Right, which sometimes we don't get the right person because we're not asking the right questions, but that's a conversation for a later uh, to, uh, podcast. Um, but two, uh, customer attrition. I mean, how much money do we have, uh, are we spending in our organizations to go find new customers? You know what I mean? One of the things that we talk about here, and I always talk about, is the fact that, listen, guys, we don't need more customers if we can't take the best care of the ones that we have. You know what I mean? And the thing with me is, is, is that a transaction statement or is that a relationship statement? That's 100% relationship. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and that reverberates throughout our customers, right? When we're on the phone, right? We, we, we are not trying to get you out the phone to handle another one. We're on the phone and we're completely, you know, connected, you know, to you. You know, it's really cool now that I think about it. Um, Victor our newest uh, guy on the help desk said something to me really powerful. Let me grab it. Right. And this, this is a, you know, 20 year old kid right here, right. That's been, that's kind of coming through um, our, our training program. But he says, you know what, Chris, it's important to understand 
that we need to connect with the person versus connecting with the machine. That's that's important. You know what I mean? But but that right is what's coming. I didn't. That's not my words. Right. That's coming from our help desk. Okay. That's the culture that we're creating. You know what I mean? So I, I think that's that's really powerful. And and I've got it on a sticky note here, and I've got to figure out how to create some sort of marketing piece around that because I think it's important. So, you know, back to the, the, you know, topic, you know, people over profits, the two most expensive parts in your organization, uh, employee retention and to customer uh, attrition, right? We spend so much money on sales and marketing that, that what if we, we didn't spend so much on sales and marketing and we beefed up our customer service team, right? Here's the deal, right? We, we talked about this in some new marketing materials. Customer service as a culture is not a, a phone number or it's not a department. It's, it's the whole organization, right? When you have happy customers, right? Everyone, I mean, everyone's talking about everything, right? The ripple effects in the market, you, you just can't buy that kind of advertising. Uh, what about employees, right? I mean, employees are, you know, I love working for that company, right? And if you love working for that company, you're going to love doing work there. You're going to love buying the products, you know what I mean? Because... Here's what here's what's going on in the in the world today, especially you know social media websites and and all this other stuff. We can we can say and we can write damn near anything that we want, right? And I've got some some website samples here that we're gonna gonna kind of go through, and we're gonna talk about what the website says, which is really de- what really is is sexy and juicy, versus really what the experience is, but. The sales and the and the marketing team, right? It's almost the easy part. Okay, it's expensive, right? Think about how much money we spend on. But but bear with me. You 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 want to know where the rubber hits the road, right? Where does the rubber hit the road when you purchase a product? When there's a problem. Okay. When there's a problem. Okay. Let's just let's just talk about how much fun it is to call Verizon, <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's talk about, and why do you call Verizon? Because you have a problem. All right. Pick another one, CenturyLink, right? I wrote them down here. Uh, CenturyLink. What about um, Amazon, right? Amazon used to be fantastic, right? But but Amazon returns, um, not not as easy as what it used to be. What about shipping? Prime isn't what Prime used to be, but the Prime price keeps going up. Yeah, it's funny you mention that because I was just looking on Amazon yesterday at a product and it was like, you know, it's got the little Prime shipping logo and it was like two weeks out. Yeah. And it's like, it, that's what I'm paying for? Yeah, but but Amazon has just gotten so big, right, that, that the – and the other thing is I don't think Amazon's the cheapest price anymore. No. Definitely not, right? What were the – so – so you you jumped on with Amazon for three things, right? Customer service and returns, two day shipping, right? It's not the same anymore, right? It's it's shifting, right? So it started off, you know, maybe as more relationship based, but it's clearly, you know, transactional. You know what I mean? Have you been to Amazon's website? It's I mean, how it to get someone on the phone to explain about what's going on? Uh, it's terrible. Here's the deal. If your website doesn't have a phone number on it in plain Jane and you can't call someone getting on the phone, you don't care about the customer. And and so many of the larger companies, it, you can't even find a phone number now. No, and, and there's a couple of them uh, uh, in here. Or you send an email and you, I don't know where the email is going, but it's it's – you know, getting lost in translation somewhere, but, or if you do get a reply, it's just some generic form that, you know, was auto generated to you. Yeah, 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 exactly. Right. So, uh, people over profits, right. We, we talk about that in, in our cultures, but we don't, we don't necessarily support that. So, um, it, it's, well, let me just get into the three companies. Right. Um, so I had this experience with a company called King electric. Okay. So my dad bought. Um, he's got a he's got a big shop, and he bought a, a electric heater to heat the thing. And um, they uh, he you know put it in, did whatever, and um, it stopped working. So he called them, and they sent him a new thermostat because they thought you know troubleshooting thought it was a new thermostat, right under warranty, whatever. So they they sent him a new thermostat. 
put the new thermostat in, didn't work. Okay. Here's the first telltale with that company. Um, they didn't troubleshoot it anymore. They just sent him a, a whole new unit. Now, I'm on the phone with him and talking about it because I've got a, I built a, a shop too, right? Which you've seen. And I needed a heater uh, to make that happen. So my dad said, listen, I just got this, uh, I got this king heater. I'll bring it to you. And if you can figure out what's going on with it and troubleshoot it, you know, you can have it. So I'm like, okay, I get over here, I get to James and he can, you know, do a little testing and whatever he does. So we got over here, uh, James popped it open and sure enough, we pulled the mother, uh, the, the logic board or whatever you call it, the thing with all the green on it, whatever the brains. And clearly there was a, a burn capacitor. You could see the black on the thing. I mean, clearly. So I said, all right, well, that's interesting. So guess what I did? I called King Electric and said, hey, I got this you know, product. I gave him a serial number, whatever. No, actually, sorry. I called King Electric, uh, went through uh, support, and um, this is another interesting thing. And I couldn't get anyone on the phone, but they said, listen, uh, you want to stay on the line or do you want to you know, uh, have a rep call you back with your place in line? So, of course, I said, you know what, I'll... I'm already a skeptic, right, about what customer service is. So I said, all right, let's see what this looks like. Okay. Uh, they called me back in like 45 minutes, right? Talked to a guy, super nice. I said, this is what's going on. He said, okay, I want you to take three photos. And I want you to take a picture, you know, the front, the side, the model number, and, and whatever he had to do to verify, you know, whatever. So I sent him the, the uh, three photos, you know, whatever's done, and emailed them to him. And not thinking that anything was going to happen. They were going to have to send me whatever. So he sent me an email back. He said, okay, uh, we're going to be uh, sending you a new part uh, coming out of Seattle because that's where they're American made in Seattle. And um, no charge. And you'll have it in the next you know couple of days. I'm like... Well, that's pretty sweet. So he sent me, so he replied back and he said, well, I need your, you know, shipping information, whatever. So of course I sent him all to that. Uh, the following day, I get an email from him with the, with the tracking information. And two days later, what shows up on my door, I get it to James, we put it in board and away we're going. Okay. I, I don't, I, I didn't even buy the product from them. Right. But they stood behind you know, that product. Now, I'm not sure why my, you know, my dad didn't do that or whatever, but um, he got a new product out of it. And, you know, he swears by it. And with with the two heaters that are out there, they're both in production, my dad's and mine. But do you think what, what, what kind of customer do you think I am now with King Electric? Well, you're, you'll probably go with them for everything you need in that. Yeah, category from now on. Yeah. And, and they got residential, commercial, heating cable, you know, I may mean, not necessarily, but I see thermostats and some other stuffs in there. But any conversation that I hear of anyone that's looking for a heater, I'm going to refer to them to King Electric, right? Don't, don't even fart around with what's going on, right? Now, here's what's, what's cool about King Electric. I went to the website, right? Because I wanted to see what it really was, right? And, and I did this today. So here's what, here's what King Electric says. Um, on their website. We believe 60 years of experience matters. Since 1958, King Electric has manufactured American-made smart heating solutions, building a legacy of trust. Okay? Building a legacy of trust and delivering unparalleled reliability. Okay. Did they build a legacy of trust with me? Yes. Absolutely. Right? But how many? But how many times do we do we see that on a website? But as soon as we call customer service, what they say here on the website doesn't doesn't mean anything. Because it's a buzzword, right? It's a buzz phrase that you throw out there. Legacy of trust. What does that mean? Well, in your case, it means something. You experienced it. Yeah, and and I think that that's where we we are our companies, our sales and marketing, our customer service. Our, our culture is not in alignment with what we're doing. We're so focused on the transaction, right? These guys created a customer life with my dad and they've created a customer life with me. W what they say here has to be happening inside the organization or that wouldn't be happening. You know what I mean? So um, 
so I, I, I scroll down a little bit more because I obviously I'm, I'm interested in this. And it says American innovation. We do things a bit differently than most. Yes, you do. Um, as a family-owned business from Seattle, we build the best heaters in the world right here at home. Okay, here's what's important about this, and here's what, uh, here's what I like about that. Um, they build it right here at home. So, so if they were building that product in China, right, do you think that the customer service experience would have been the same? No. Right, because w- what would happen? They probably wouldn't even have the parts. They wouldn't one. even have the part here. Right, they're outsourcing all that stuff, but by but by understanding that um, I'm going to control manufacturing, I'm going to control my entire product right here. I'm going to be able to provide the highest level of customer service. Right, moving moving your your call center overseas. Right, and this isn't this isn't about you know whatever negative or or, or being I don't know what I'm trying to say, but well, being about transaction, right? We're we're moving our call center, right, overseas to whatever it is because it's low cost, right? We're, we're, why are we manufacturing in China? Be- because they say it's more expensive to manufacture here. Well, the question I have, is it? Is it really more expensive? Because if you look at the, the entire cost model, right, it, I, would, I would really argue with the fact that it, it isn't. You know what I mean? Well, and especially because when you move the manufacturing overseas unless you have unusually high quality control you're essentially just manufacturing disposable products you can't fix anything yeah look at look at the story with traeger right traeger was an unbelievable company they got bought and then they moved as soon as they moved everything to china and it went the, the product went to went to hell it, it did right i think traeger is bouncing back now I, I don't know too much about that story but but it's just one of those things where the, they manufactured the part here I sent the pictures to the dude. He probably walked back to the warehouse or sent a ticket in or did whatever, and they had the part. That's powerful, right? That is is understanding the fact that, okay, we're going we're gonna to stand by. We're going to build the best heaters in the world. And what did he say up here? Building a legacy of trust and delivering unparalleled reliability. You, you can't do that if, if you're not controlling all of your manufacturing. So, so that was cool here. Uh, the second part of that is the technology that goes into our products was inspired by customer feedback. I love that, right? Customer feedback, right? It's customer feedback, just it, it understanding what is it that the customer wants, right? It's, it's demand side sales versus supply side sales, right? How many, how many customer, uh, companies do we have out there that are building products just to build products, right? They're building products for the transactions, right? They understand that there's this numbers game. Okay, well, the more products you build, the more you have to support them, right? Better to have a a clean product line. And we're we're gonna talk about that when I get into Peloton's website. Um, But I love that. Products was inspired by customer feedback, right? One of the things, you know, here with us is we know what our customers are, are experiencing because we ask them. Right, that's one of the things that we do. Right, all summer, last summer, we had all the meat needs. Right, all that was was about saying thank you, showing gratitude, and then getting straight feedback. Right, what's working for you? What's not working for you? What can we do to help your business grow? And then we take that feedback, and then we innovate. Right, we're we're not sitting down here saying, oh, you know what, so and so is doing this over here. Maybe we should try that. That's too expensive. You know what I mean? And then trying to push it. Right, it's supply side sales versus demand side sales. Well, and, and seeking real feedback like that, not just give me five stars and call it good. You actually want to know what worked, what didn't, how can we be better? Yeah, exactly. And those are the three questions I always ask. So I'm, I'm glad that you could recite them. Um, and then this, you know, with the simple goal of making your life easier and more comfortable, right? The process when I called in for support was smooth. It was simple. It was not, the dude didn't even ask for a receipt, he doesn't need to. It's his product, right? I think that that you want customers for life, and I also think that it's important for 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 us, right? Especially, you know, we, we talk about global warming, we talk about all this other stuff. There just seems to be that if we're going to create a product, we should be able to support that product for the life of the product, right? Because if you're not willing to support it for the life of the product, why the hell are you selling it? Well, and yeah, instead of trying to make an excuse, oh, you're not the original purchaser, you don't have the proof of purchase or the 
write code or whatever it is. Yep. The product is there. Something happened to it. We'll make it right. Yeah, Vortex, right, in, in hunting, right? My, I've got my spotting scope. I've got two pairs of binos. Um, I've got the rifle scopes. I'll buy a used rifle with the Vortex on it. I, I know that it's warrantied, right? I have to worry about sending it, you know, in. That's powerful, right? Because now I'm not creating uh, any sort of doubt and saying, oh, well, you know what? I need to go buy a new rifle scope, right? Once you acquire a customer, you you should have the culture to support that customer for the life. They should never have to go anywhere else. And King Electric uh, was good about that. Um, the last thing I want to talk about on the website was this operational excellence, Quality customer service is paramount. Yes, it is. Right? Absolutely. It, it, it is, right? And and the thing about it is that your customer service is your culture. It's it's your entire organization. I, I would love to go visit King and just, you know, walk around and look at that because – and I love the website. I love the experience. I've been using the product. The product's fine, right? It's great. Um, but it's the customer service that makes the product even that much more better. Um, and it says right here, we are a team of accurate, efficient, and connected people that can help you find the right product for your application. And they stand behind that. And, and you know that I love the word uh, connected. Okay, so that's that's King Electric. That was that was a month ago. Okay, let's talk about the second one that I had uh, here. So um, a couple of weeks ago, this is this is recent, right? Um, I'm standing at the at the kitchen sink after dinner, washing the dishes. And I, I pull the nozzle down and, and I go to pull it down and I pull the nozzle right off the hose and I got, I got the, the wild water snake shooting water everywhere. Doris is over here and, and, and whatever. And finally I get the, you know, it's just one of those things where, where you don't know what's going on. What, where's all that water going from? Right? Seriously. And then by the time I figure out what the hell is going on, shut the water. I mean, we had water everywhere, right? We had it on the ceiling. We had all of the stove. Anyway, um, so I yanked, I, I pulled off the, the nozzle onto the hose. And then the, the snake thing, you know, the weight in the bottom of the, the cabinet rolled back into, into, the, um, uh, into the, the throat of uh, the faucet. And I'm like, okay, well, that was interesting. So I'm looking at it, and I see um, – you know, a bunch of corrosion on it, whatnot. So we put a big sticker. This is funny. We put a big sticker right on the thing for, you know, out of order, right? So you went, you know how many people actually still use the sink? Trey, I, unbelievable. We had water all all day, all evening. And so um, anyway, we put a big sticker on there. And I called my buddy Jason, um, who's a plumber. And I said, I shot him a picture because I couldn't find the, the make and model anywhere on the damn thing anywhere and i shot a picture over to jason he said oh that's the that's the moen arbor or something and i said okay and he said just call 1-800 by moen you know whatever it is so next morning guess what i did called 1-800 by moen same thing got got a uh, got a support got a recording it says we'll call you clear press line all right so of course the skeptic i am all right we'll see what this is like so uh i get the call back okay get the call back and uh, she says, oh, okay, I need a couple of photos, okay? But she had a little bit better system to King. I could take the photos and I could text the photos to her. Mm. So I, uh, she asked me a couple of questions. Was it the rounded or the square or whatever? Anyway, I took her the three, the, the three I think she wanted three photos too. I texted her the photos. She looked at the photos and said, oh, you know, blah, blah, blah. she goes, you need these three, these three parts. And I said, well, doesn't, you know, whatever. He says, no, Chris, that, that's all the piece that pull off. It's all one piece. It just doesn't slip back. Okay. Like, okay. So anyway, so um, once again, she asked me for an overseas. She asked me how long I had it. I said, well, I, you know, I got it from uh, Ferguson, you know, whatever, a couple years ago, right? She's like, I don't think she was asking me. To, from a warranty standpoint, I think she was asking me how old it was because they think they had changed something between model years or something. Mm. And so, I, you know, I asked her the questions. No proof of purpose. Nothing. I sent her the three photos. She got she and and she got my email or contact. Sent me an email and um, asked me for my shipping information. Whatever. Hour later, I get this um, shipping confirmation. 
your parts are, are being ordered. Then the other thing that she said to me was, listen, I'm going to send you a 75% off coupon that you can use one time on the Moen.com. What do you think I did with that coupon? Bought more of their products. Damn right. I went onto the thing and in the, in, in, in the master uh, bath, we need a new shower head. And it was like, I, I, seriously, it was like $265 or something. I got it for like 71 bucks or something, you know, 75% off. Um, and they, so I bought a new piece of product from them. I'm like, sure, right? I mean, if this is the level of customer service that I'm going to get here, you're darn right. I'm going to go buy something there. So uh, I got a, a three new parts. Uh, I paid for a second day, right? I could, I, I didn't have to do that. I could have just n normal shipping. So I paid for second day. It cost me 25 bucks to have it second day because we had had water everywhere had I not done that. Um, so I got the parts, um, came in the mail, took me you know all of about half hour. It took me more time to get the crap underneath the sink out of the way, right? We've all been there to actually get that repaired. Uh, Moen had created a customer for life. I had no idea that that's what they did. Right. So the question for me is, okay, well, why, why isn't that, why didn't I know that? You know what I mean? Um, and, uh, am I ever going to look for, you know, another company, right? What's the competitor? To, uh, I'm sure there's, there's, Delta. Com there's competitors everywhere. Yeah. I'm not going to risk going to Delta or any other brand based on the experience that I had with Moen. Why well, would I? And, you know, like you said, you, you didn't know their customer service was like that because with most of these companies, you don't know until the first time something goes wrong. And in all likelihood, that first experience, good or bad, will inform your opinion about that company for well, the rest but, of time. Yeah. Think about all the experiences we have, right? I mean, think about how many bad restaurant experiences we've had in the last year. It's, it's terrible or just bad experiences across the board. I mean, I, I just, I, I mentioned Verizon. I'm like, I try, I called those people three times and I wanted to, um, uh, upgrade Dries's and my phones to the, to the 13 or whatever. And, um, I wanted to pay for them. All right. I didn't want to finance them. Well, with Verizon after three phone calls, right. And, and mind you several hours, if Verizon would not let me trade in my phone and buy the phone outright. The only way that you could get the trade in is if you finance the new phone. I said, I didn't want to do that. I went round and round and round. And so, um, I ended up just going to Apple. I went to apple.com, picked out the two phones, got the color. Dries, you like this color? You like this color? She picked out the color, got the gigs right and, uh, paid for them at, at Apple. They were ready to go in two hours went to the mall, picked them up, boom, whatever out the door. Okay. The, we make it so hard to do business with our customers anymore that it's terrible. We're, we're great on the front end, right? We're really good on the front end. You know, the other thing that, that frustrates me and why I left DirecTV, because I kept tired of seeing all the, the great promos that they were offering all the new customers, but they wouldn't offer the promo to me. And I've been with them for like eight, nine years. So finally I said, y you don't care about me. What you care about is acquiring new customers. Why don't you just take care of the ones you have? Right. I, I've had that same experience, uh, a technology company I was dealing with a while ago. And I, I, you know, all these great features listed and got hooked up with them. And then it was like, hey, what happened to all the great features? Oh, well, those were those were for new customers. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, you're not a new customer anymore. So <laughs> this stuff doesn't apply to you. Yeah. And, you know, I get it. You're trying to attract new customers, but that's not a very good way to keep the ones you've already got. Yeah, I mean, uh, Verizon, CenturyLink, all those guys. Listen, if if you're on the stock market, you're you're answering your transactions, right? You, you're going, and I'm going to get into um, I'm going to get into that one on the other side. But my experience with Moment was fantastic. Okay, I got one more three. Okay, so those are big big companies, right? So I'm guessing King is not publicly traded, but I'm guessing it's a bigger private company. Moen is publicly traded. Okay. Um, this one is a local company, right? Okay. So uh, B&K Painting is the name of them. And as you just experienced, right, with your roof called, you know, four different roofers and got, you know, between seven and $14,000 in, in estimates between what's going on. It, it's crazy how it is. Anyway, so we did the same thing on the painting and we got three bids and they were all over the place. But 
B and K painting um, uh, came out, and I just kind of had an instant rapport with um, with. Uh, sorry, excuse me. I'm gonna look up his name. I believe it's John. Um, uh, uh, Cole. I wanted to say anyway. The owner, basically the general manager, came out, had a really good rapport with him, and um, yeah, John Cole. Okay, I want to make sure I give credit where credits due, and you know, super great guy. I mean, kind of like what you had with with the with the guy that you chose, right? It's about connection, it's about relationship. The other guys were all about shit. I got to get my commission. This is what's going to be, whatever. You you can see right through that. But here's what here's what's cool about being K. So they did a great job on the house, okay? Um, but they, we've got these these big pillars, and uh, on the outside, and we um, put up the Christmas lights over winter, and the paint didn't cure or something, and so I put the Christmas lights all all around the sink, and I just tore the hell out of them, right? And all the paint started to peel off, like in, in some in sections. Anyway, so I sent it over to 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 B and K Lachelle. And I said, hey, listen, uh, I took a couple photos and she goes, you know what, Chris, you, can we just wait till spring to come out and get that done? I said, absolutely, positively, 100%. Um, so they, they just left yesterday. Okay. The other issue that we had was the gutters, right? So we had the gutters painted. We didn't use new gutters with the, with the paint on them. So, so B&K came out. And they looked at the thing and said, "Okay, we're gonna we're gonna change this up, you know, whatever." Um, and they came out and they they stripped the paint off the gutters. They stripped the paint off the pillars. They used a special primer to you know to handle whatever, and repainted um, all of the uh, the stuff that didn't come off. And Jerry's is like, "They're not gonna warranty that. That's just you know whatever." Well, it, it, I. I don't think that's the case, right? Well, that should have happened. No questions asked. We got it scheduled. We got it coordinated. We we got it everywhere. The other thing that they they did that was really cool is um, they fixed uh, they they restained all of our doors, and we couldn't find find the stain, and they forgot to stain you know one of the doors, and they had to come back. I bet you they were back at our house uh, three or four times, you know during you know kind of during the process for whatever. But not one time um, did I ever feel like we were annoying them or we were taking advantage of them. You know what I mean? Because there are people out there that, that will kind of do that. So the experience I had with B&K painting, in contrast to the painter that we used for the remodel in the master bedroom, uh, it was a time and material job and it just went sideways, right? I mean, it it was all about, you know, hours this and, and hours that and, and whatever. And consequently, we're never going to use that painter again. And I was just telling my buddy the other day, I said, listen, um, I was on the phone with him because the painters were running around and I had to move the car uh, because they didn't want the overspray and whatnot. And I said, listen, B&K painting, unbelievable, right? Customer for life. Any any paint that we want to do in our house, B&K is going to be doing it, right? I'm not, I don't have, I don't even have to go look anywhere. How powerful is that for B and K? Well, and just you're telling me that story means next time I need painting, I know who I'm going to call. Yeah, exactly. The, the, we just don't understand how powerful that is, right? I mean, we, we get these, and this is the thing that we run to on the sales side, right? We we want we want to grow our businesses, right? But but sometimes we grow our business to spite our face, right? To, to spite our customer service. Right? How many businesses do we grow that we know? And I'm, I'm going to talk about another company that I just went because I was just on the. Uh, that's a conversation I was had with with Justin before you right, right when you walked in, is that we've got a vendor that used to take really really good care of us when they were first starting out, right? And they got a, they got a pretty good product. The problem is the customer services went to hell in handbasket, right? Now when we send a support ticket in, we we don't get an answer for 24 hours or, or a long time. You know what I mean? And the problem that we have is we can't be working with vendors that don't have the same support. They're not in the same alignment with with us. You know what I mean? So um, we're looking to make a change, right? So 
So companies, right, will will provide a really high level of customer service, right? But then as they start making money, they start making money. They forgot to, oh, well, we need to make sure that customer service is still in proportionate to sales, you know, and revenue and whatnot. And that's typically not the case, right? They, they're doing it just to, just to get ramped up and, and do whatever. That's a terrible mindset. And, and how many, especially restaurants, have we seen that with? You know, a restaurant opens, you go there, everything's nice, everyone's good, they take good care of you. Grand opening's great. Right. And then a year, two years later, you go back, hardly like the same place. Yeah. It, and, and that's terrible. You know, the thing with B&K, that culture is intentional, right? That that comes from the top down, right? That's what that's what most people don't understand. Sorry, I got to take my jacket off here. Um understand about uh, what they understand about culture. It's a top down deal, dude. You can't do culture from the bottom up. No. Has to come from leadership. Has to come from the CEO. You want to know what kind of company your CEO is? You you pick up the phone and you talk to customer service. And it has to be an ongoing commitment. Co- customer service and for that matter culture will deteriorate over time if it's not being maintained well either you're creating culture or it's creating you right yeah i mean we've talked about that uh we've talked about that before okay so those are the three great experiences and 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 i love those those things i don't have to go look for another faucet sprinkle you know whatever customer uh, King Electric, you know, I'm probably not going to do much business for them, but anyone, anytime I have, you know, if someone that's looking for that, that there's going to be a first thing. And I don't even fart around looking around, right? The customer service is unparalleled. Um, and the same thing with uh, with the painting. Okay, that's powerful. Okay, um, because they don't need to market to me anymore. I, I'm, I'm already done, right? We don't ha- we're not looking for for new turnover. Okay, so let's talk about um, Peloton. Okay. Poor Peloton. Um, so I did some more more research into that. Man, I was like, okay. So Peloton obviously did great during the pandemic, right? I mean, you remember you couldn't get dumbbells, you couldn't get yoga mats. I mean, you just couldn't get anything because people were working out in their homes. Okay, well Peloton, you know, shot through the roof. They're kind of like Zoom, right? All you know, all these these stocks that went into place, and so. Now I, I think they something happened, and they've got a new CEO, and um, Barry McCarthy is a new CEO there. Okay, Barry, I don't know what to tell you, but I'm 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 gonna provide some guidance because I think you're in a tough spot. So, um, Peloton got a new CEO because they're restructuring. Okay, they're restructuring because why? <laughs> A lot of reasons they made some mistakes. Well, yeah, but but it's really stock price, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, stockholders are pissed off. Okay, stockholders are pissed off uh, out with the CEO, and someone's going to come in and, and do the dirty work or whatever it needs to be. Okay, so I just I just did a Google search, right on Peloton, and I went to I did it on Google, then I went to news, right? So I just found all the news articles. Uh, what do you think I found in the in in the news articles? Mostly just talking about how their stock is down, how their company is down, how their <laughs> yeah transactions. Oh yeah, all transactions, right? N- not a damn thing about you know how great the product is, how much our customers are are loving it, how we're getting our community healthy, you know, all this other stuff. So I just wanted to read this article. This is from The Verge, and I don't read The Verge, um, but I just think it goes to show. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna kind of highlight. I, I highlighted this stuff in here, just to kind of run through the contrast between transactions and relations. So, uh, when Barry McCarthy stepped up as Peloton's new CEO last quarter, Ammon news of the company had laid off. Okay, so here's the first thing: they laid off 28 employees. Okay, uh, typically, um, why did they lay off the 28 employees? Because they couldn't afford them. Yeah. Well, it's the fastest way to to fatten the bottom line, right? Regardless of whether we needed them or not, you know what I mean. Twenty eight hundred or twenty eight hundred employees gone. Um, McCarthy had been vocal about quote unquote <laughs> shifting the company's focus from hardware to software. Well, what the what does that even mean? How about we go from transactions to relationships? 
Well, and and their their shift is part of what's causing them to lose customers is because instead of supporting the equipment, it's all about trying to get money based on ever increasing subscription prices. Yeah, um, but I just think it's interesting shifting the company's focus from hardware to software. Uh, uh, we're in we're in the fitness business. I, I would think Peloton, right? Fitness bikes. Uh, that new direction can be explained by looking at today's. Oh, here we go. Q three Q three earnings which paints a tough financial uh, uh, picture for Peloton. The company continued to post larger than expected losses in stock prices, subs- uh, subsequently plunged more than 20, uh, I got to cut off here, but um, 20%, I'm guessing, right? Stock has been getting killed. Um, Peloton said today that its Q3 losses were 757.1 million. Okay, great. Meanwhile, revenue slid. There's another transaction from nine hundred, uh, from one point two six billion to. Nine, okay, it doesn't matter what the hell these guys are doing. My point is the fact. Oh, and then um, increased costs due to higher than ideal inventory. Right. So they got a whole you know shit ton of inventory sitting out there that they can't get sold. You know, and um, they are down to eight hundred seventy nine million dollars in cash, which goes to the other call. Right. They're looking for private equity. They're looking for um, some sort of pension fund to, to inject them with liquidity, which, which is interesting to me. And then they get another thing in here, uh, uh, Peloton total revenue, right? So I get the graph, obviously. Um, in April, the company announced it was slashing prices uh, for all of its hardware, but it was raising the cost of its all-access membership. Okay, who's that for? Is that for the customer or is that for the stockholder? That's for the stockholder. It's for the stockholder, right? You think the customer is going to be happy about that? Right, no. and then he goes back in here at the end of the the <laughs> at the end of the article. He says, um, and I'm really not trying to pick on, um, I'm not trying to pick on Barry, but this is this is kind of the problem. Um, we're not going to know. Um, we're not going to know what the price increase. Uh, the company won't know until it knows, and, and he's he's talking about well. Is that four dollar increase or whatever that number is going to be? You know, detrimental. It's kind of like Netflix. Oh, what the hell? How is Netflix raising the prices? Are you kidding me? There's no more value to that. Not only are they raising prices, but now they're saying by the end of the year they're going to start putting ads on the platform. Yeah. See, see, you think that's? Think about where Netflix started. Think about where they're going. They may have, they they completely holistically started from a relation standpoint. Netflix was fantastic. Right, easy to use, cost effective, whatever. Now it's bloated, right? The search, the movies, you know, whatever, um, and it's expensive. I don't know how many prices for what. And, and and that's the thing, you know, their their stock is down. They're getting fewer customers. That's the reason it's down. And they're like, we're getting fewer customers, so let's raise the price and add ads. Yeah. Well, it, what's that going to do? That's not going to bring in more customers. That's going to turn off your existing customers. Right. Um, yeah. Don't, don't get me started on Netflix. Uh, same as Amazon Prime, right? These subscription models keep going up. Are you? What do you, are you? How is that possible? They keep increasing the prices, even as they keep decreasing the value. Yeah, exactly. Um, now, here's a bright spot. I did like this, and I did jump onto Peloton's website because I wanted to know more about this. The company also began piloting a new subscription model called One Peloton Club that allows users to rent the bike and take classes for a monthly fee, all in one fee. Now, that's pretty damn powerful, right? That that to me shows that okay we got excess inventory, okay. Um, how can we move that inventory and get people on the bikes, right? Because here's the here's the thing. No one's answered the question. Why aren't people buying bikes? What happened? People went back to gyms. Okay, but but th- do we know that? That that's just pure speculation. How many people do you know that own a Peloton bike? One or two. Okay, I, I know uh, a few people too. Uh, have you asked them when the last time they rode the Peloton bike? No. No, they, they're not riding them. The question is, why aren't they riding them? And my point is, we don't know why they're not riding them. I'm, I'm wondering if Peloton knows why they're not riding them, right? Come back to this this customer feedback, right? If, if we're just, you know, creating problems or creating solutions to satisfy the the shareholders, we're never going to get out of the uh, we're never going to get out of the the slump that we're in. You know what I mean? 
so all of these things that that Barry's doing right now is to to um, calm down the stock price. Well, who cares about stock price, right? If you if you look, who are the most important investors in Peloton? The customers, the customers, and the employees. And Those I, are the most important investors. Everything they're doing now is reactive. Oh, it's all reactive. Yeah, they don't. They don't. And, and maybe they are. I'm just reading right through here, and I jumped on the website. I mean, I, I, I'm just kind of speculating. But the thing about it is, I'm just trying to get to the point. So many transactions, right? We have an entire company. All right, I did the math. You want to? Here's here's some interesting math. Okay. Um. Okay, so if they have, I think they said in here they have like seven million subscribers. Okay. Okay. Monthly subscribers. They have uh, a few different plans. They got a twelve dollar plan, a twenty five dollar plan. A thirty-nine dollar plan, and then their fifty-five dollar plan, which is, includes the bike. Okay, if they have seven million subscribers, like let's just say average fifteen dollars a month, because I don't know what the ratios are, and I'm not gonna, you know, whatever. Uh, that's one hundred five, one hundred and five million dollars a month. Okay, annualized, that's one point two six billion dollars a year. You're telling me that you can't create a profitable company at one point two. Six billion dollars a year. I mean, how much money do you, do these people need? And that's that's just a subscription based on the products they've already sold. Yeah, that doesn't include new sales for you know bikes and all this other stuff. So I, I'm not getting into that. I'm just saying, what would it look like if if they started focusing on the Peloton user, focusing on the customer? Well, and so so much of what we hear about these companies losing money is really that they're not living up to their projected growth instead okay, of just but, trying but to who cares about projected growth? Who cares about projected growth? The stockholder. Okay, well well what I'm saying is we're we're so concerned about the damn stockholder that we're losing focus on what the most important person is in the organization. That's my whole point. And and ultimately you cannot satisfy the stockholder without satisfying the customer. Maybe you can in the short term, but in the long term, you'll lose them. Yeah, and I'm going to get to I'm going to get to another uh, contrast to that too. Um, I had a I had a note here. How is Peloton creating customers for life, or how are they creating subscribers, or how are they creating members? Right? Uh, because I got this I got this great graphic here that that talks about churn. Right. Well, who cares about, you know, the churn? Well, stockholders do. Right. I mean, I understand it's an internal metric. I get that. But the thing about it is, what are we doing to to understand why that churn is? Right. Are they really going back to the gym? Or maybe they're not doing anything. Right. Maybe they maybe they don't like the shoes. Maybe they don't like I mean, there, there could be a 100 things. Right. Um, I thought it was interesting. And in here he said, um, uh, of course, and this is from the writer, I guess, really, um, uh, you'd expect McCarthy to be bullish on his own company. Okay. Well, it's not his company, right? I mean, sorry. That, that's just kind of how I looked at that. Um, the other thing that I thought was kind of interesting, which is, uh, it says right here, which is interesting when considering its recent launch of the Peloton Guide, and it's got rumors that it'll eventually release a connected rower. Okay. Do we really need more products? I'm not sure. I'm not sure that we need more products. Um, I think the app is is kind of interesting, and and I'm not running this company. It, it's one of those things, right? So so we're going to get into the rower market right now. Why the we we can't even get the bike figured out, and we're going to enter into a new market. You know what I mean? The other thing is, I thought this was interesting. I don't, I didn't read it in this piece. I read it in another piece. Was they they were thinking about um, moving all that inventory they got. Uh, into retail. So in other words, they're, they're just going to kick the can, you know, move that inventory off their balance sheet onto someone else's balance sheet. It, it, we're not fixing the problem here, people, right? That that right there is going to be good for the, the stockholders, right? That Maybe. Yeah, maybe, right? Because if you can't sell it online, direct to, direct to market is, is powerful. And they can't get that figured out. Retail is not going to be – retail is dying. If they can't figure out how to retain the customers they have, they're not going to be able to get around that fact by just trying to acquire new customers. Yeah. Yeah, I just uh, – I have some notes here. Why are – so it says um, – We'll likely see more hints of what McCarthy's got planned at Peloton's annual homecoming event later this week. The event is generally aimed at Peloton's loyal fans. Okay, I, I tell you what, you get all those people together, I, I would be trying to figure out what, why they are loyal. Why are the fans loyal? 
And here's the other thing that, that we have with feedback. And this is important too, is sometimes these focus groups, right? And I've heard, I've heard this about focus groups. You get people in on focus groups and the focus groups just tells you what you think that they, that you want to hear. You, you've got to really be able to have conversations of connection and feedback with truth and honesty. You be able, you got to be able to to really get the truth, get the facts, um, because if you're not getting that, and they're just telling you what you want to hear. It's terrible, you know what I mean. So why are why are Peloton customers um, so loyal? And and it's that will will help them move from supply side uh, sales to demand side sales. Um, and then it says here, um, but given that it's happening so close to earnings, oh oh oh, here we go. It's another good opportunity for Peloton to drop its hints for ANSI investors about its product roadmap and how it plans to get back on track. Okay. Um, it, it just, it's just interesting it, it, how we just get so caught up in transactions. Okay. I, I think the stock market is terrible. You know what I mean? And I'm not going to get into that, but but here's the deal: what would what would Peloton look like if they were not answering to the stock market, right? Because what's the stock market? Is is stock market really uh, long term or short term? Unfortunately, it's mostly become short term. It's all it's all short term, right? I mean, you're not investing in Coca Cola today like you were investing in Coca Cola 10, 15 years ago, right? I mean, or Disney, or you know, any of those blue collar blue chip stocks that were whatever. It's so volatile. Well, instead of investors seeking to be, you know, part of the company, they want to own the company, they want to be part of the company in the long term, they're just looking for a short term profit that they can flip the stock and buy something else. Okay, that's exactly right. So with that said, I'm going to talk about Michael Dell. I'm going to talk about Dell computers. We sell a fair amount of Dell computers here. Um, the thing that I liked about Michael Dell was when he took his company private. Right, And I'm going to read an excerpt here about why he took his company private. Michael Dell partnered with Silver Lake Partners, a prominent private equity firm, to take the company private to allow it to focus more on its long-term strategy without having to be pressured by the short-term growth, profitability, and equity analysis focus on quarterly earnings. And look at where Dell's out today. Yeah. Fantastic company, right? But the thing is that that Dell, Michael, was having to make decisions based on what was best in the short term for the transaction for the stockholders and not doing what was best for the company, right? It was the, the I don't know what the, what the facts in here, but it was um, um, the largest private company um, – Uh, largest, um, I forget what the number was in here. I, I thought I had marked it down, but it was a big deal, right? Yeah, and, you, you don't see companies that size going private very often after they've gone public. Well, yeah, but but the thing about it is that that kudos to him as as a CEO, as a leader, understanding that. Listen, I, I got to get out of this this nonsense. I cannot have this noise putting pressure on me because at the end of the day. The value is in the you know in the culture, right? And the things that he needed to do long term to protect his brand was not going to be the best for the investors. And the, it, shame on the investors for not you know understanding that. Well, what you need to do to have long term growth doesn't always equate to the short term quarterly growth that the market tends to prefer. Yeah, yeah, it's. Um, and then in two, so 2004, Dell stepped down uh, as a CEO but maintained his position in chair after some hiccups. Uh, he came back in 2005 or 2007. Um, it's tough to find, you know, good guys like that, you know. But I, but I think the, the, the whole point is the fact that um, customer services is a culture. Right. And, and if you, if we stop focusing on transactions and we start focusing on relationships, right. With our employees, when you, when you take really good care of an employee, what's the ripple effect that has not only in your organization, but throughout our communities. 
Yeah, that's an interesting point because it really does go beyond just the business itself. Yeah, exactly. I mean, with with the guys here, you know, I want I want my guys to be incredible people, right? I want them to be the best versions of themselves. And as I help them do that, right? As I empower them to do that, everyone wins, right? Our organization wins. Our vendors win. Uh, them as dads win. Them as husbands win. Them as friends win. Everyone wins, right? Our organizations just can't be about profit, right? We've lost sight of that. But the thing is that that we'll say people over profits, a bullshit. Let me sit in one of your one of your operations meetings. Let me sit in one of your sales meetings, right? Let's let's look at the things that we're talking about. What are we What are we doing to create connection? in our office? What are we doing to create, you know, relationships? How are we handling hard conversations? How are we acting, you know, as a team, right? It's, it's interesting transactions. And I, and I put this on a sticky note because I want to make sure that I talk about our vision statement, right? You technology is what we do. It's not who we are, right? We get so consumed in our lives, um, in our personal lives and in our families, uh, in our churches, in our governments, it's everywhere. We get so focused on the transaction, right? We get so focused on the do that we don't understand, which is the tra- you know transaction. I said that that we we forget that it's the be. It's who we get to be when we're doing. You know what I mean? And it's about being kind. It's about being compassionate. It's being about empathetic, right? We talk about empathy, right, on on, on our fourth pillar. Right with people, no, sorry, uh, that's empowerment. The empathy is on our customer service. It's a, it's a number one um, bullet on the top. We have to be empathetic to our internal customers. Right, I always tell the guys we we serve two customers here. We serve each other first and foremost. Right, be, be, we spend so much. How much time do we spend at work together? Uh, often more than we spend with our families. Yeah, so so it needs to be healthy, right? Because a healthy environment here will help provide a healthy environment outside of these doors, right? A toxic environment here helps create toxicity outside of these doors. I mean, how many CEOs do we do we hear going out in front of the TV, right? Let's talk politics. How many politicians do we hear, you know, talking about whatever it is that they think that we need to hear, right? Which is all bullshit anyway. And, and, and what's funny is all the advertisements that I'm seeing starting show up on YouTube because we, we vote next week, right? Um, and, and, and we don't even listen to them because what they say is not what they do, okay? And when we have CEOs in our organizations talking about people over profits, but everything that we, we talk about is transactional and profits, we're not in alignment, right? And we're really losing value in our organization um, and and we're really doing our communities a disservice our, our businesses are incredible incredible institutions for um, continued betterment right w- us as humans are in constant development right we need to be in, in an environment where we're teaching people how to be better people right or how to be kind or it's okay to be kind good lord you know what I mean and compassionate and empathetic, right? And love. Um, and, you know, ha- have hard conversations, right? So anyway, so that, 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 that's kind of, it's amazing to me. One article kind of gets me charred up about whatever it is, but I'm just, it's this, it's terrible, right? And the thing about it is, how do you write the ship? Well, it's it's about the alignment, right? I mean, that's what you were talking about earlier. You know, you can you can put anything on a website. Well, you know, you talk about the political videos, the same thing. You know, you have a whether you're talking about a campaign or a company, you have a marketing director, you have a communications director. You know, these people are out there to craft a message and spread it. And then you have the actual work, whether that's a policy director on a campaign or it's the, you know, the customer service lead in the company. They're not they're a different person than the person doing the marketing. Yeah. And if there's not alignment there, you're going to have a dysfunctional culture. Well, and, and we have dysfunctional cultures, we right? Do. Right. I mean, we have dysfunctional families, 
right? We have dysfunctional governments. We have dysfunctional um, churches, right? Because we, we get these people, um, and I, I'm not even calling them leaders anymore. I don't call a CEO as not a leader. Uh, I've, I've changed my mindset on my, my vernacular on that and the fact that, listen, a CEO is a CEO, right? Just because you're a CEO doesn't make you a leader, right? Sorry, right? Just because you're the governor of, of the state does not make you a leader. You're the governor, right? And in my definition of leadership is, is you know, much different, but, you know, it's kind of like the difference between um, influence and empowerment, right? I, I don't, I don't want to influence my guys to, to be better people. I want to empower them. I want, th I want them to make the choice. I don't want them to make the choice because I want them to make the choice. You know what I mean? There's a there's a big difference. Well, and it won't last if they're only doing it because they feel like they have to because they feel like that's what you're telling them to do. Yeah, it's 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 kind of like um, uh, motivation and inspiration, right? I I would much rather empower you, right? Educate you, teach you, um, provide the environment for you to grow in, right? And and here's the deal: we have to understand that growth is about mistakes, right? Sure. And but but how many of our organizations uh, don't allow people to to make t uh, mistakes? Maybe in innovation, uh, maybe in you know in, in shipping and this and that you know whatever it is. Um, mis mistakes are are going to happen. It's not about being perfect, right? Uh, it's about being better, right? And then the thing about it is, um, how do you manage those mistakes? Well, and and. It's, it's about being better because, right, a company isn't that different than anything else in nature, right? Entropy happens. If you don't actively work at it, things will get worse over time. That's the natural direction of things. Yeah, and I, and I think in, in our organizations, we think sales are going to fix everything. More revenue, more revenue, right? I mean, the whole thing with Peloton, how it got kicked off, is the fact that they're out there looking for more private equity. Well, dude, I don't know how much cash you have, but, but you know – and I'm not privy to all that stuff, right? And I'm and I'm kind of being critical, and I'm kind of looking at that stuff. But it's it's just the point of, it's possible, right? Pelican can be a great company. It doesn't have to be a five billion dollar company. Great company. You could be a fantastic company at one point two billion. You know what I mean? Yeah, they they they're not going to grow their way out of their problems. Well, how many? But but look at look at all the companies that that we built on speculation. Right. Well, and how how many big companies have we seen it disappear in recent years? Yeah, bigger is not better. Sears, Montgomery Ward. I mean, you know, we've seen these companies that had were huge, that had long lineage pedigrees, and they've disappeared because they didn't have that culture. Yeah, they didn't have the the culture um, sucked them up. Okay, that's it. I, I think culture is from the top down. It has to be about relationships. You have to understand about relationships. And the thing for me is it comes from it comes from you. It has to start at the CEO. It has to start with the president of the company and it has to work down. Um, so my question is how do you how do you put that in place? I can only speak to what we've done based on my my leadership and what what we've done is the fact that I think you have to have a very clear vision statement. Right? And the vision statement has to be has to be the the all it has to be um it has to be encompassing about what's what are we doing that's bigger than inside our walls you know what i mean then i think you have to have a clear defined mission statement right and the thing about it is that uh our our, our so our vision statement is technology is what we do it's not who we are right it's not so much what we do it's who we get to be when we're doing it right um but our mission statement is we keep your computers in internet running fast and secure, right? Uh, everyone has to get behind your vision statement. Everyone has to get behind your mission statement, right? A good vision statement and a good mission statement provide all the direction that you need for your organization to make decisions. And when everyone is on board with that, you have a common goal. It's it's the beacon, whatever, okay? Uh, most people's visions and most people's mission statements and core values or whatever it is, all written by attorneys, it all it's all bullshit. It all sounds good, right? Whatever. Um, that's not going to do anyone any good. Like, why, why am I here? Right. Am I here just to, to, you know, answer the phone and, and help people with, you know, how to connect their Bluetooth device to the phone? 
Or are you here just to earn a paycheck, just to get through the hours until you can clock out? Yeah, exactly, right? I mean, th there's so many so many things. Um, the other thing is I think you, you have to we, – we have our core pillars, right? Um, I think you have to figure out how to get that disseminated. The bigger the company, the harder this is going to be, right? The, the great thing about what we're doing here is the fact that I've, we've got to build this from the – you know, kind of from the ground up. But I tell you what, this culture here is 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 powerful, um, and it, we could think think about um, what what's the problem with mergers and acquisitions today, right? Y you get you get two different companies, right? Maybe they're syn uh, synergistic, maybe they're not. Maybe they're just you know gobbling up to to you know embed their their software, their firmware, their technology into to your product. You know, look at look what you know Microsoft has done to good companies, right? Um, they take great you know Skype, right? Great product. They rolled that up and they they kind of bunched it, and they then it went from from Skype to they had one other product they tried to do and that failed, and then now they're doing Microsoft Teams and you know whatever. But when you when you take a, a company that's got a good culture. Or not a, a bad culture and a bad culture, you, you you're toast, right? I mean, it's it's bad, and and the bigger company with the work with the with the stagnant culture absorbs a smaller company with a great culture. What do you think happens? The great culture goes away. Yeah, the great culture goes away, and we saw that with you know uh, Time Warner and the acquisition from uh, Level Three, and then uh, Central and eventually. But that's kind of here, no there. Culture is, um, culture or customer service is a culture. It's not a department. It's not just a phone number, and it sure as hell is not just an email, right? It's it's a it's a whole thing, and it's about relationships. It's not about transactions. So, anyway, uh, that's all I got. Sorry for the the video feed on the on the end. You'll get a, a cool little uh, still, um, but we. We hope uh, we provide some insight. So I appreciate you guys uh, listening, and we'll figure out some other uh, hot topic, and we'll get after it. But it's definitely going to be about culture. So anyway, my name is Chris. Uh, thanks for watching and signing off.